we got Warframe is a wake up call from your boy Legendary Drops. Let me see. Warframe is a wake up call. Look, the phrases free to play and live service, whether by themselves or in combination with one another, don't fill players with a lot of confidence. And they shouldn't. Because they become synonymous with games and studios that are under delivering on a product and service while asking for the absolute most from their audience. More time, mm -hmm. more engagement, more money, extracting as much as they possibly can while putting in the least amount of effort. Yeah. Warframe is the most well known yet under discussed and underappreciated games in all of gaming. It's often. Bro, like the last month, I've been getting going hard on Warframe and holy shit. There are so many systems. It's crazy. Often referred to as the internet's best kept secret, and I'm tired of it being a secret. I think one of the reasons is it is be one of the reasons is it's a secret. A secret is because. So I think World of Warcraft kind of figured this out. World of Warcraft is a 20 year old game. And with a shitload of expansions behind it, you know, you have your base game and then how many expansions does it have? Uh, like what? 11, 12, 13, however many crazy amount of expansions, lots of content. Um, conventionally, if you were to th like just pick up any random gamer and just show them world of Warcraft with you know, this is the base game. The, and then you show them the 11 other expansions up until the current expansion. They would be so turned off by the amount of content. It is so daunting to look at, to see that, holy shit, not only do I have to get the base game, I also have to pay for all these expansions. No, thank you. But, you know, thankfully, Blizzard uh, saw what was happening. And uh, I think, you know, World of Warcraft is like mostly free to play unless you're playing like the current expansion, in which case you, you pay like a like a premium box price. And then you can like boost your character up to like 10 levels below, like whatever the current cap is for the current expansion. And then Blizzard just expects you to play the, the most current expansion. And... And that's it. So there's like, Blizzard has count, came up with a built-in uh, catch-up mechanic, essentially. For the 20 year, like how old is World of Warcraft? For like the 15, 20 years of content that it has built up. It is the amusement park MMO. Tons of different things to do. Tons of content. Tons of quests. Massive. Warframe on the other hand, is the opposite. I think Warframe has been out for like, what, 10 years ish, constantly coming up with like bug fixes, coming out with content patches and updates. And it's great. Love it. But I wasn't since, so like my experience was that I was like, I dabbled in Warframe up to like mastery, like what, like rank five. And all I was really doing was like, just capping out a warframe and then getting some weapon and then going on like another mission, capping out some weapons, capping out some uh, warframes or whatever, and just be like, oh, this is the core game. Like, oh, maybe I'll get some mods or, or whatever. Maybe I'll get some guns and maybe I'll get some blueprints and I'll just build some stuff casually. And at the core of it, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, but the thing with Warframe is that there are so many extra gameplay loops in there <sighs> to a new player that's coming into Warframe and realizing that there's no real catch up mechanics other than spending like money for platinum and all that jazz. Other than those catch up mechanics, it's very daunting to be a free to play player trying to jump into Warframe and trying to like understand what you're supposed to be doing in there 
So I think for that reason, that is why it's one of the the best kept secrets for uh you know online video games or whatnot for all intents and purposes warframe is the blueprint by which many of these free-to-play games and live service games should be following but they're not i it's actually game agree tirelessly supported by its developer and by its community in a way that i don't even think any other game can even replicate and once you guys hear about some of this stuff it's going to blow your mind Free-to-play and live service is supposed to be a way for developers to be able to deliver a smaller product and grow it over time. Be able to deliver a valuable service, a valuable product, and grow it while the community supports it. And I can understand if Warframe started out as like a little sprout. But now, this thing has turned out to be one of those uh, redwood trees that... They had to b drill a hole through it just so you can like drive your car through it. It is huge with how many systems are in the game and how many different play style cycles are in the game. You could do your conventional Warframe combat. You could do, spoiler, like you have like a little operator uh, inside the Warframe. You have that style of combat. You have uh, like a little roguelike thing, a little roguelike section where you can like gain little power ups uh, as uh, you know you progress through the the missions and whatnot. Uh, you have skateboards. You have uh, what else? You have a uh, arc wings, which is like a uh, like a, essentially like a jet pack. Um, you have arc wing missions. Where you take your little jetpack and you like fly around space, but you do it as your Warframe. And then you have uh, spaceship battles, your railjack. Uh, what else? I'm probably missing like a couple, but you have uh, you have missions where. You, you're not even your Warframe. You are like an enemy, like, Grenier unit or an enemy Corpus unit. And you play as the enemy in some missions. And it, it, there's like a, one Warframe where you can actually like create like some sort of like music and beats. There's like an entire like music simulator thing in there. Uh, it is partly Guitar Hero. Uh, what else? I'm probably missing some because I haven't even like touched on that part of the game yet. But just with that alone, uh, Warframe, you, it's so many things. And that's the kind of game that Warframe is. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And luckily, today's sponsor is actually the game that inspired Warframe. I've played World of Tanks multiple times over the years with my friends, and this is an easy suggestion to make. World of Tanks is one of the longest running free to play games on the market and has been actively oh, supported for over a decade now with over 100 million registered users, hundreds of tanks, and tons of customization, high fidelity graphics, incredible sound design, and hundreds of hours of gameplay. The extensive arsenal includes tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks, providing you with a wide range of options for different combat That's a strategies. long ass barrel. It's a free-to-play game that brings hell? you massive battles with a huge variety of tanks. Whether you're charging in guns blazing or sneaking up on enemies, there's... Bro, this is like if Michael Bay made Fury. <laughs> with how many explosions are in this shit. There's always a new way to play. And here's the best part. New players will get an amazing deal using the invite code COMBAT and the link in the description below. You'll get a Cromwell B Tier 6 British Premium Tank, 250,000 credits, and 7 days of premium access. Plus, you'll get to try out three other Tier 6 tanks for 10 battles each. Just Dang. use the link in the description below to get started. So what is Warframe? It's a looter shooter, live service MMO with a third person perspective. You play as a Warframe, you're dashing through levels, taking down enemies, farming up materials, currency, and other items so that you can continue to build more weapons and more Warframes to use. Yeah. Warframes vary in their looks and abilities. Some of them play like a ninja, others like a battering ram or even a wizard. There's even... Bro, the amount of stuff, the amount of different, like, character archetypes in, in Warframe, it's actually crazy. Like, yeah, you have your guns and your melee weapons, but then on top of that, 
you have like four different abilities that you can press and you have like a passive. That's a lot of stuff. Even a frame that lets you create your own music so that you can buff other players. You have pets, ships, clans, PVP, personal housing, boss fights, a roguelike, a fighting game, open worlds, and more. It has consistently stayed in the top 20 of the most played games on Steam for over a decade now. Dang. And in doing that, there is something inherently special here. If we look at the game's player base on Steam, while it's not burning the world down with insane peaks, it's maintained its player base consistently since 2013. That is stability right there. That shit is stable. Well, kind of. You know, you got your spikes and your, your peaks and your valleys and whatnot, but like... If you look at the trend it was only getting it was like growing and when did it like peak it peaked in like what 2018 2019 and it's just like more or less like maintained maybe it like trended down a little bit and then maybe it's like coming back up a little bit <sighs> solid 50k at all times and it's only continued to grow so how has warframe maintained that success why is nobody talking about it? And unlike many other live service games, why aren't we hearing people complaining about it or how it mistreats its players? Well, to answer that, we need to understand the game's history and that of its creators. Now, you may recognize the name Digital Extremes, renowned for their early work on Unreal Tournament in partnership with Epic Games. They played a pivotal oh. role in shaping the landscape of multiplayer first-person shooters. They were among the first to popularize key features like online multiplayer, power weapons, team deathmatch, and capture the flag, oh. laying the ground for many of the multiplayer games that we play today. After parting ways with Epic Games, as Epic went on to make Gears of War with Xbox Studios, they decided to pitch their own game idea and they tried to do it for over a decade. That game was called Dark Sector. They struggled to find oh, yeah. a publisher for this dark sci-fi MMO concept that they had. And ultimately, Digital Extremes was forced into doing work for hire just to be able to keep the company afloat. The decision to take on work for hire projects while necessary for financial stability came with its own difficulties. The studio faced a cycle of hiring employees for specific projects and then laying them off once that project concluded. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the current trend with, uh, at least for AAA gaming. You get hired for a big project, and then once the big project is made, and then you have that little reference on your resume, uh, it's like, yep, okay, I got that reference from that AAA company. Now I need to go find uh, either another AAA company or maybe like a smaller, uh, more stable company. Uh, I don't know. This practice is commonplace for work for hire studios. However, it disrupted the lives of their employees and their families, a situation that the studio founder has regretted since then. He believed that publishers Dang. often lacked a clear vision and that digital extremes would have been better off just focusing on smaller self-controlled projects as seen with independent studios that tend to produce higher quality work when they're given full creative control. Despite the continuous efforts to pitch Dark Sector to publishers, the studio continued to face rejection, primarily due to a lack of interest when it came to sci-fi games on the side of publishers, a sentiment that somehow never even changed even with the success of Halo. Hmm. In a desperate move, Digital Extremes caved to a publisher's demands, shifting Dark Sector from a sci-fi MMO to a game that emulated the success of Resident Evil 4 at the time. This change involved transforming the protagonist from a space ninja to a CIA operative named Hayden Tenno, which strayed very far from the original concept. Dang. The new version of Dark Sector struggled to be able to find an audience. However, it eventually did and gained respectable reviews as well. Bro, I played Dark Sector. Dark, I thought Dark Sector, for the time I played it, I thought it was a good game. Well, after the release of Dark Sector, the industry started to trend away from AA releases to AAA games, and this made for more issues at digital extremes. The studio, which had previously worked on Bioshock's multiplayer and The Darkness 2, found itself struggling to find any contracts as they began to dry up and publishers wanted to start making games in-house. Observing the success of free-to-play games like World of Tanks in 2010, Digital hmm. Extreme saw an opportunity in an emerging market. They didn't see free-to-play as a way to be able to milk players. They recognized and saw the potential to be able to create something smaller and grow the game over time rather than trying to pursue a traditional release. Facing imminent financial collapse with only 12 months of funds remaining, Digital Extremes decided to pursue a long-held vision for what used to be Dark Sector, and then was now codenamed Lotus. 
Within two months, they developed a working demo featuring spaceship raids and procedurally Dang. generated loot and layouts with an emphasis on co-op and PvE gameplay. Recognize Dang, that's pretty crazy to think that they had like procedurally generated stuff back then. That's actually crazy. Because when I was a little kid, uh, like one of the big like scope games that I played was uh, what was it? <sighs> Fucking uh, not Skyrim, the one before Oblivion, Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and you know subsequently Skyrim. If you were to told like tell me that each one of those dungeons was handcrafted, I wouldn't have believed you as a little kid. I thought the the computer was randomly generating uh, tunnels. And I didn't realize that somebody, it wasn't until like, you know, years later, and I discovered like how video games are like actually made, that Oblivion and Skyrim both had like, all the, the dungeons and whatnot were just, was just hardcore like handcrafting tunnels and whatnot. So I can appreciate the, the whole handcrafted versus procedurally generated stuff. Because the procedurally generated stuff, that still has to be, like, handmade, too. ...there was a gap in the market. They approached free-to-play publishers, asking for support, but they were getting rejected yet again. Undeterred, Digital Extremes decided to self-fund the project, with only nine months of funds remaining, wanting to give it their all, rather than simply just walk away. The development of the alpha version of the game saw significant involvement from Rebecca Ford, an intern who led the creation of their community team. This team was crucial in gathering and responding to player feedback, a strategy that helped shape the game's development and ultimately its success. Embracing the success of Kickstarter campaigns that were going on at the time, Digital Extremes introduced supporter packs to raise additional funds. This approach, while initially slow, proved ultimately effective and demonstrated that there was an audience for their game. Thus, mm -hmm. Warframe was born, a game over a decade in the making who had faith in itself Scorned by an industry, nobody else wanted to make it except for them. Dang. It released into beta on Steam in 2013 to over 20,000 players and has only continued to grow since. Over the years... Yeah, I wasn't there for like the beginning days of Warframe. <laughs> I've come to realize that the vast majority of the studios that we grew up loving, the games that we grew up loving, the biggest studios and publishers that are out there all came from very similar humble beginnings. But mm -hmm. the vast majority of them forgot about it. At the ones that don't end up being the ones that are the most loved and appreciated. Look at Larian Studios. Their story is almost identical to Digital Extremes. They started off making their own games to limited success. They did mm -hmm. uh, work for hire for a while just to be able to keep the doors open. When that industry started to dry up and move away, they went to go make their own game in Divinity Original Sin. They danced with bankruptcy, almost losing the entire studio. They found an audience that wanted to support it. And now look at them. Baldur's Gate 3 is heralded as one of the greatest games of all time. Oh, they yeah. They up as they deserve to do so. When I look around the industry right now, I see a lot of studios that are making games not because they want to make them, but because they're profit-motivated. Yeah, the whole profit-motivated thing. <sighs> I mean, I don't know. Like, when I was a little kid and all these, like, companies were building up their reputation... It's like, yes, it's like, it's, it's like a hot button, not a hot button, but it's, it's kind of scary when you have like, n like no reputation and you're just putting out an IP out for the first time versus like being an established studio and it's like, you're kind of stable. And then the only thing you're worried about is like, uh, you know, all of your monetization practices are like set in stone, more or less. But it's like when you have no reputation and you need to make one, that enough is a motivator for you to make a good game. But when you ha have a good, rep an established reputation already, it seems the trend is that, you know, I don't know, like, somewhere somebody loses, like, their sense of, like, morals or, or, or whatever, and it's, it's like a, like a slippery slope, essentially, that 
It's like, oh, we'll just nickel and dime the player. They won't worry about it. And then a couple of years goes go go by, and it's like, oh, but it's just like a dollar increase. It's like it's just two dollars increase. It's like, oh, it's just five dollars. It's just ten dollars. And over the course of time, it's like you look back, and it's like, oh, we weren't really charging anything for DLC or microtransactions. And then you look forward, and it's like, look at all these microtransactions. Look at all these cosmetics. Look at all the stuff we're we're you know charging extra for the player. But you know, conversely, the player doesn't have to. Uh, spend money on microtransactions, but I mean, if that's your favorite game, then you know, you're kind of a product of your environment. If you're playing a game that has a lot of microtransactions, you're probably going to be playing, paying like some amount of money. Purely profit motivated. They no longer look at players as anything other than tools for making money, and that's it rather than looking at them for what they actually are, which is a means to be able to deliver a higher quality product, use their feedback and their information to be able to earn their money, and then by extension, make your game even that more popular. Because when players are happy, they tend to talk about it a heck of a lot more. And I've also noticed that you know games are a form of art, and without soul, there is no art. And in the case of games, I think a lot of players are starting to wake up and realize they can see it in your trailers, they can see it in your gameplay, they can see it when the soul isn't there. Yeah. And when they know it's there and they see it's there, they're into that game. But when they don't see it, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And I think that. Yeah. I mean, not only that, I mean, you can kind of see it in that if a company decides to take an IP that is already established and tries to make a game out of it, then it's kind of clear what the company was put there for. I mean, at least uh, that's what I see as like an older gamer. I don't think uh, like younger people will tend to see, like younger gamers will, will tend to see that. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they will, but I doubt it. Maybe they, maybe they won't. I don't know. That's why we've seen a lot of games over the last few years fail. Digital extremes started out with good, great intentions, to be honest with you. But that doesn't mean that they didn't make the same mistakes that many other free to play and live service games make time and time again. And that's with its monetization. But the difference is they learn from their mistakes. I don't think anybody can disagree with this. Recently, over the last few years, both live service and free-to-play games have permeated through every space in the entire gaming industry. Every single company wants their Fortnite, Counter-Strike, Genshin Impact, whatever it might be, and of course they would, because they draw in revenues. It would mm -hmm. make you wonder why anybody would ever want to make another full-priced game again. Oh, yeah. Wasn't it Sony that had, like, 10-plus live service games lined up? for like this year to be released or something like that. <laughs> but then Suicide Squad came out and it is essentially just dead. I was like, I could do this. Uh, <laughs> Steam charts, Suicide Squad. Yeah. Suicide Squad is essentially dead. <laughs> but with the introduction of free-to-play live service games, we've seen year over year, month over month, players are losing ground, losing choice, and losing their money. Free-to-play has become synonymous with cutting content and player achievement and putting a price tag on it. Yeah. While the gameplay itself is free, the model has incentivized developers to paywall everything in the game or put in absurd time restrictions and hurdles for players to be able to overcome just so they can try to earn anything with their own time or their own skill. Studios today are incentivized to actively harm the player experience and lower the quality of the overall product, all in the name of higher profits. Digital Extremes was incredibly nervous about getting into free-to-play because they were afraid that they were going to do it wrong, and in fact, they did. At first, they started selling power, and it wasn't the reputation that they wanted to create Bro, what is this form of Warframe? Like this version of Warframe had like a gigantic uh, skill tree. 
like upon level up, you gain like some talent points and you could go shield capacity, health, power max, move. This is crazy. Like compared to like modern day, like when you gain a level, it's just like it automatically puts uh, you gain a little bit of health or shield capacity or a move or something like that. A rank up of a, of a move. Huh. This is kind of crazy to, to think about. Create for themselves. At the creation of Warframe, you could double the capacity of your mod or skill tree slots in your Warframes. However, there was no way to be able to earn this in-game, and the only way that you could get it was by paying for it with real money. Early mm. on, before the game's beta release, Digital Extreme saw the player's feedback regarding this issue and removed it and any other perceived pay-for-power microtransactions, vowing for fair monetization to be a core tenant of the studio moving forward. That's actually crazy. This is a company that took away the ability to pay to win from a, a system. Has, uh, there have to be like more than just one example, this one example of game companies doing that. Like there has to be. This can't be like the only example. In that move and other changes that they made due to their deep involvement in the early foundations of their games community, they fostered a positive community spirit and gained even more support. In an interview six years ago with Danny O'Dwyer of No Clip Documentaries, they mentioned how difficult it was for them to be able to find any marketing or visibility because at the time, nobody wanted to touch free-to-play games. However, the positive community that they had already started to culture, the fact that they had been listening to their community, ended up catching the attention of the late great commentator, Total Biscuit, who came to cover the game and catapult its popularity into the mainstream. I think that this is one of the most valuable lessons for Digital Extremes or any company to learn, and it's that good things happen to good developers, especially hmm. those who treat their players as well as Digital Extremes and listens to their feedback. Game developers, large and small, need to recognize that they are providing a product and service to us, not the other way around. The expectation is on them to create a fun, fair, entertaining, and valuable experience in exchange for our money. When yeah. I see game developers posting on Reddit talking about how they hate gamers because of YouTube live streams. Oh, this this little uh, post. Am I allowed to say this? I kind of hate gamers. Uh, as I'm a professional game designer, and I'm worried that I'm starting to hate gamers. Watching the gaming events on YouTube last month uh, with one chat on was extremely disheartening experience. Every time a character that wasn't a, a cishet white man appeared on screen, the chats would fill with messages calling the game woke or complaining about DEI. Every game that wasn't a shooter or hyper casual competitive online game garnered Z's and boring comments. And then I checked Twitter and it's just people complaining that the Metal Gear Solid 3 remake is not yellow enough. People telling me there are right ways and wrong ways to beat Elf Ring. He means Elden Ring. <laughs> and people... <laughs> these guys are stupid. <laughs> telling you the right, wrong way to play Elden Ring. <laughs> and hate and people hating on the new Dragon Age. Because the trailer doesn't match the tone they had imagined for it. <laughs> I've seen people implying that the the MC main character in Fable trailers is ugly because it's self insert of some random level designer working at playground whom they have deemed not fuckable enough. <laughs> Surprise! People want to play like good looking characters. This is look at every game that's been made in some way, shape, or form. The main character is fuckable, all right? Because if that wasn't the case, history would show more ugly characters, but that's not the case. <laughs> I don't know. It's just the internet magnifying negative voices, I guess, doing what it does best, but it's making me real tired of gamers. <laughs> does this person realize that there are more people that play games besides the ones that are on the internet? As a matter of fact, there are more people that aren't on the internet making comments about on Twitter and shit like that. Then there are like people that are doing that. 
stream comments or how a lead Starfield developer makes a Twitter thread saying, Oh Jesus, this fucking emoji, dude. Anytime I see this emoji, this like thread, long thread, one of 15, I am just like, no thanks. Scroll past. Funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development. Yeah, nobody cares about the realities of game development. Just come out with a good product. Do you care how your shirt's made? How it comes from China or child labor? No, you don't. Do you care how your phone's made? Uh, with, uh, you know, all the cobalt mining and shit that goes on in wherever the fuck. Uh, with, with, like, people being in, like, bad working conditions. No, you don't care. Uh, do you care about the working conditions at Amazon whenever you order a thing off Amazon? No, you don't. So why should I care about the realities and hardships of game development? I don't. And yet they speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory. So what the hell do I really know? Not a lot. No. And you shouldn't really know. You don't want to know. All right, because you could easily apply this. If you eat meat, you don't want to know what happens to the animals that are raised and slaughtered for the sole purpose of being a piece of fried chicken on your plate, buddy. You don't want to know, okay? You are blissfully ignorant. And that is a good thing. I mean, if you want to know, that's great. You could probably look at like uh, some YouTube videos. But a lot of those YouTube videos, ironically, well, not ironically, but it is kind of funny. They're really old. Not a lot of new YouTube videos or documentaries have came out about uh, factory farming of animals and whatnot. So, yeah. Nobody cares about the realities and the hardships of game development. Dang. Funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development, and yet they speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory, so what the hell do I know really? Not a lot. And neither of these opinions that these people have are in the minority of opinions. With what authority do players speak? With their money. They are your paying customers. Yeah. Paying customers. While players may not know exactly how to voice their concerns, and oftentimes will do it in the wrong way, you still should be listening to them because they are telling you that something is wrong with your game, and at the end of the day, all they want is a better product, which only serves to make you more money in the end. We've seen... Yep, you can always depend on the player. Maybe not for the best solution to a problem, but you can depend on the player to tell you that there is a problem. Developers stray from the side of players. However, how many developers have you seen remove a microtransaction from their game because players were using it too much? That is a wait. Didn't uh, what's that one game? Was it uh, New World? Not New World. That's like the MMO. What's that other one? Like the top-down one. Didn't they like cap the amount of money that you could spend in a day from like three thousand dollars to like only a thousand, or like maybe three thousand dollars to like five hundred dollars or something like that? It was, I forgot what the heck the game call, was called. It was like a, like a top-down or like action RPG. Uh, I forgot. Ah, uh, whatever. It's, I think it's like, I don't know who's playing it any, anymore, to be honest, but whatever. When Warframe introduced colors for their pet skins, they didn't realize that they had inadvertently created a gambling mechanic where players were trying to search for the rarest skin colors and the combinations that they wanted. This is kind of hilarious to me, though. <sighs> Charging people for colors. I mean, at the end of the day, it's always just pixels. But it's kind of funny when it's in the form of colors. It's colors. Do you know how many, like, full $60, $70 games are made with a full uh, encompassing customization like customization of the main character system and you could just choose any of the colors you want but no that's not good enough players there are some companies that charge you for colors 
And this is like hilarious to me, dude. Cause like, I'm like, what are you guys doing? DE saw that a player had rolled his pet's color 200 times and their stomach sank. Within a day and a half, they had removed the mechanic from the- There's always that one guy. There's always that one guy that ruins it. Game and reworked it without the need for player feedback. The spirit of that can be found throughout the entire game. As of a recent update, now everything in the game, just about everything in the game, is earnable in-game with very few outliers. Yeah. Warframe uses Platinum as its in-game premium currency, and it's fully tradable. Players can go out, farm valuable resources, mods, weapons, and Warframe blueprints, and then trade with other players without ever even spending a dime. You would think that this is trapped behind some type of end-game progression or something, right? No, you can start doing this within the first 15 to 20 hours of playing the game. That's actually crazy. Being able to trade the premium currency for some doohickey that you can farm in the game. So you could trade your time for the in-game currency. Like, let's say you juice up like one Warframe to farm this one specific thing really quickly. You just get a bunch of those things and then just start trading them. That's, that's really cool. I was already trading items with other players and stockpiling currency from the minute that I had started. While players still have the option to buy anything that they want from the game's in-game shop, all of those things, or at least the vast majority of them outside of cosmetics and color palettes, can be earned in-game. So, Mr. YouTuber, that means that Warframe must have the most difficult and high-end equipment behind paywalls or something, right? It has to be insanely difficult to get. No. Not really. Critical warframes and weapons are called primes. You can earn these by cracking relics, and you get relics constantly while you're playing the game. When you go to do these missions to crack the relics, you're playing with four players, and all four of you can choose to use the exact same relic, which would then increase your chances of being able to get what you wanted, because yeah. everybody can choose from everyone else's rewards. Meaning that even if you're in a party that... Yeah, it's not personal loot. It's like public loot. <laughs> which is... Pretty freaking cool. ...isn't coordinated and you're all running different relics, if you don't get what you want out of yours, you can just get a copy of somebody else's thing if it's more valuable. You can choose to get whatever you want. Every weapon, every frame, companion, and otherwise is at your fingertips. You can earn your way through Warframe without ever even spending a dime, and many players have. There is no time wasting in Warframe. And what's even more crazier is that adding to this absurdity, they show players how not to spend money within their premium shop. If you go to their premium shop and look at any of the items available in it, next to every item, it tells you how to go earn that item in game rather than spending money. Yeah. They teach. Yeah. Do you want to make this item? Well, just go get this stuff. Achieve this mastery rank, which is like your account rank. Go get these little items. You see all those little checks? It's like, yep, you got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah, just go make it instead of spending money. What other game has done that? I can't think of one. Teach players how not to spend money in their shop. But that doesn't mean that players don't support the game. In fact, they do quite a lot because by making things so accessible, giving massive discounts on their currency and things like that, being able to just get all the things that you want in the game by playing it, players just want to spend money on the game because they want to support it because they love the game so much not because they feel like they need to imagine that imagine a world in which the players are not spending money on a game because they need to overcome some fabricated barrier that's put in place and if they spend money they're going to be able to get through it faster or get through it at all no instead they're spending money because they actually want to support the game they just are enjoying themselves and want to spend the money I think even if you look at like all of the egregious games or the most egregious games of even Diablo Immortal, I think the tippy top 1% uh, of those players, I think those guys generally genuinely want to play and spend money in that game too. Not because they feel forced, 
by the game, which is, you know, kind of undeniable. But this whole, like, genuinely, genuinely wanting to spend money on the game versus feeling forced, it's like there, there's, like, the top 1% of whales that just do it because I have all the excess money versus the 99%, which is, like, the casual player base feeling uh, all the FOMO because they don't have a lot of money. I mean, in any case, regardless of what monetization system is used, there's going to be some people that feel like they are genuinely wanting to spend money and some percentage, like if you were to show all of this shit to like a new player, someone that's never seen Warframe, they will probably think, oh, this is pay to win. This is, this is stupid. But the, the context needs to come with. I mean, but yeah, it is kind of pay to win, but it's kind of not because you can farm most of the shit in the game. But by definition, it is also pay to win because you can just spend real world, world money with it. So it's like a little context dependent. Now, mind you, some of this is definitely driven by convenience, but the vast majority of players just love the game and want to support it. And that's not to say the like modern day warframe gameplay the core game loop of it for a warframe feels freaking incredible it's ha it has some of the best movement in the game or, or in the industry i love sprinting i love crouch sliding i love bullet jumping uh i love aerial aim gliding I love wall running, uh, I love wall climbing, wall latching, wall bouncing back and forth between walls. The, the core movement system of the game feels awesome. The gunplay is pretty good. Uh, as far as visual clutter wise, I mean, A, it, 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 there's some like, there's a little bit of visual clutter, but uh, they could probably work on that with like the explosions, the numbers covering up the bad guys. And it's like a, like a tiny little nitpick that I have with it. But I mean, the, the core game loop of it, of the game feels awesome. There aren't areas worth criticizing. I'm still not a fan of the fact of them having 12 to 72 hour crafting timers on weapons and warframes. That's just <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't really like the timers either, but uh, I kind of get it why, why it's there. Yes, you can like rush it with, with platinum, but it's also like, uh, okay, this thing is in the oven cooking, uh, go back and do something else while this thing is cooking. But it's like, as a gamer, when you want something now, you want this shit now, especially with what a pain in the dick it is to farm some of the resources in the game. And let's say you get like the, your favorite primes, uh, blueprint, you get the neuroptics, the systems, the chassis and whatever fourth little random thing, either like a Roken cells or, or something like that. And then you got all that shit. It's like, great. I'm about to hit build. Boom. Three days. You got to wait. You got to put that bitch in the oven for three days. It's like, well, shit. What do I do in the meantime? Oh, I, I guess I'll just go farm something else. That's, that's the loop. But I wish it wasn't. <laughs> it's just too much. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just too much. And also, there's a big limitation on the amount of weapon and warframe slots inventory slots that are available early on for players that's yeah. something that in general just needs to get fixed yeah you are just simply given not enough slots it, it's ridiculous and you having to spend like that's like one of the, isn't that like one of the few things that you have to spend, spend platinum on but it's like a very small amount was it what is it like like 15 plat for like a, a warframe slot or a weapon slot or something like that. Or maybe it's like 20. I think it's 15. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty annoying. Because 
when you look at the inventory, you have like a scroll bar. And one would think that, oh, it's like an infinite inventory, but you go to build a Warframe and it's like, oh my God, you're hit with the, you don't got enough Warframe inventory slots. It's like, what do you mean? There's all these squares right here. It's like, oh, what the fuck is this shit, dude? But the thing is, is that the longer you play the game, the less those things become an issue because you have so many other things that you're working on, leveling up, playing as, farming for, while all these other things are building in the background that you mm -hmm. really don't even notice it all that much. And while there's room for improvement, this is largely the most ethical live service game I've ever seen monetized. And I don't think any other game wants to try to compete on those terms. They definitely <laughs> don't want to compete on their content. Warframe probably has like a kind of monopoly on like the third person shooter, third person melee combat. I don't know, industry. Because of how awesome uh, the core game loop feels and the, the core like game mechanics of it. Uh, as far as like some of the other systems in the game. I mean, shit, you could probably make uh, like a whole separate game based on like the ship combat because I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of the whole railjack system and the spaceship combat thing. You could probably do something like that, like Warframe, like ethical monetization with just the ship combat, probably, but I don't know. Warframe's first turning point came when the game released on Steam, which marked a critical success and provided the studio with the necessary resources to be able to continue to support and develop the game. Unlike competitive shooters that can maintain an audience with minimal updates, Warframe faced the challenge of sustaining interest in a PvE centric game which is far more difficult to overcome this digital extremes heavily leaned on the experienced development team who had weathered the storm through the toughest times and possessed the deep institutional knowledge that was necessary to make the game successful if it wasn't for the fact that they held on to their employees when the game and the studio was facing its closure they likely would have never been able to make the game the success that it is today in the years following the game's release on Steam, Warframe saw a rapid expansion in content. The studio introduced clans, player hubs, a plethora of new weapons and Warframes, and diverse gameplay elements like open world areas, vehicles, mm -hmm. and space combat. But the most significant shift in the game's identity came with the release of The Second Dream, a cinematic quest that redefined Warframe as a game. This quest introduced fully voice acted, high quality cinematic experiences with intricate writing and storytelling that elevated the game from a compelling free-to-play title to a truly exceptional experience. Yeah, this is no a good longer quest. was Warframe just a free-to-play game. It was just <clears throat> a great game that happened to be free-to-play. Digital Extremes continued to push boundaries with subsequent updates, including the new War, Whispers in the Walls, and the upcoming major update, Warframe 1999. These expansions demonstrate a level of writing, character development, and cinematic quality that's typically associated with AAA blockbuster titles and reflect nothing of what we've seen in typical free-to-play games. Except one of Warframe's main competitors that is Destiny in Destiny 2. The studio's ambition to deliver high-end content remained evident with every release, further increasing the game's reputation among players, both new and old. That's what's made the Warframe that we have today. One of the systems I was the most shocked by was at one point I unlocked what I can best describe as Sea of Thieves in Space. You get a Railjack, a fully customizable ship that you can upgrade. It has multiple weapons that are controlled by other players in co-op. You hire NPCs to manage the ship. You fight other ships. You can board other ships, steal other ships, and ra Bro, I didn't even know you could board other ships and steal other ships. Like, I am just so... <laughs> Maybe I just haven't spent enough time on this system yet. <laughs> Great enemy bases. While the feature didn't land well on release and it had its issues, what is available today is an absolute blast to play, and it feels like it's completely native to the game, and like it could have been there from the start. In the landscape of live service and free-to-play games, many... Oh yeah, there's also a uh, Dark Souls in the game, which is hilarious. <laughs> you play as a uh, this guy, and one of your mounts is like this flying Warframe horse, 
and you it has the entire gambit of uh, Dark Souls like mechanics. Uh, you can block, you can dodge, you can parry, you can counter, uh, you can heal. Yeah. Many developers opt for the safe approach, focusing on incremental updates and minor changes rather than undertaking any significant overhaul. This safe strategy often results in steady, gradual improvements, but most major additions and transformative changes end up being locked behind paid expansions, premium content, and microtransactions. Typically, free-to-play games and live service games will introduce minor tweaks, seasonal updates, and limited time offers to try to keep players engaged. While Warframe does the exact same thing, they aren't strangers to making big splashes with major updates, and all the while, they're not charging the players a dime. Other games with standard offerings can sometimes refresh the experience and provide new incentives to be able to log in, but they rarely bring the wide-sweeping changes that might significantly alter the gameplay or narrative, making the game overall feel more stale. I'll give kudos to games like Fortnite, who often radically change their map, put in new modes, and give more ways for players to be able to express themselves in games, like even creating their own games within Fortnite. However, the vast majority of games don't do this, and in combination with that lack of risk, they often let go of the developers that got them to where they are in the first place, ignoring the players that got them to where they are in the first place. And as a result, they hollow out their experience leaving them with nowhere to go. There's mm. too much focus on monetization, and it's leading to a disparity between the expectations of the player and the financial outlook of the developer. Today, we have developers that are understaffed, underpaid, under a lot of pressure, under-delivering to their audience, while for some odd reason, the company is still expecting more money. You have CEOs that are out there projecting growing profit without investing in growing content. Ooh, that is a good point expecting more money for less content that's crazy and their expectation is because you're playing then you must be paying and i'm saying <sighs> that's so funny because i don't know i was gonna do this uh like one breakdown of uh like that uh there was like a study that came out with for like skills-based matchmaking and i was gonna go through it line by line eventually and that was my initial thought of what do you call it you are playing the the main uh thing that i wanted to say was that uh, companies think that because you are playing the game you are enjoying the game um and i i can i can see why they would think that so they have to make up all these random statistics to try to peddle to their investors on how successful uh, their game is doing. Despite the fact that, you know, a community of people uh, will say otherwise. So I don't know. Um, but I don't know. That was just a really good point uh, that you made because I've thought that same exact thing sick of it look just recently i saw with apex legends the big drama that cropped up around it where basically long story short developer goes in and makes it where you can no longer earn the next battle pass by completing the last battle pass oh yeah previously you were able to and they made these changes gaslighting the players saying that it's because we're trying to deliver you guys a more valuable experience we're doing it because we're trying to grow the game and yeah, that is a business speak for give me more money. <laughs> We're giving you guys more value. That's really Yeah. Anytime you hear somebody throw around the word value, you need to turn your brain on more than the normal and really listen to what they're saying. Really what it is when anybody with any base level of intelligence can see how insulting it is to say something like that when it's so transparently not that. And they're not the only developer doing things like that. You see it across the board. So many developers that are making minor changes to their game, but all of their focus is on their monetization. How mm -hmm. else they can shift and move things around to make it where they can make more money and you get less out of playing the game. <laughs> oh my God.
Oh shit, I was gonna say something. God dang it. <laughs> and in that, the only thing that you're serving to do is make an audience that isn't loyal to you, that is just waiting, frothing at the mouth at the chance to be able to jump onto the next game and get as far away from you as they possibly can. Sure, they're playing your game right now. Sure, it's popular right now, but that's because they don't really have another option and there's nothing else right now that's that hot. So once there is something that hot that comes out, you're done. That's it. I think the whole hot factor for why a game becomes popular is simply because are their friends playing it? Okay, I'll play it too. That's simply what it is. A game gets hot because, you know, word of mouth, this is the game I'm playing right now. What are you playing? What's your favorite influencer playing? What's your favorite YouTuber playing? What's your favorite streamer playing? Oh, they're playing that. I want to play it too. Maybe I can play with them. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, I, and like, I'm no saint because when I was a little kid, like watch the streamers and shit, like I thought that same way too. Um, but there is also something to be said about going back and playing like old games, uh, like your old, like your favorite game that you played in the past. Yeah. Just go back and play it again. Just go relive it. It's not like the game is gone. I mean, yeah, you already experienced it for the first time, uh, but much the same way that you can watch a movie over and over again and pick up different little nuances in like a scene or something like that, you could do the same thing with old video games. Players are a valuable resource and you need to value them. They provide you with everything that you need to be successful, both creatively and financially. Yeah. And if you use them the appropriate way, you can be huge. You can be massive. And while that's not the truth for every single game, because every single game is different, they have a different audience, they have a different use case. Not every play, not everybody plays the same kind of games. When you value them, they keep you afloat. They help you grow. And in the case of Digital Extremes and Warframe, I don't think that there's another developer that's out there that appreciates their audience the same way or does the same things that Digital Extremes does with their audience. Bro, I actually had no idea of like how many people played Warframe off of, stream, off of the uh, Steam. Like only 50k. I was like, oh wow, that's like not nothing, but it ain't something either. But then I go over there and look on the, like, uh, the Warframe uh, Twitch channel Bro, there's always like 15 to 20 plus K people in there. It's like half the dang audience in there. Granted, they're in there for like the, the drops and shit, but still, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> Except for maybe Larian Studios. Why did you guys have to go and create a community YouTube channel? And even more so, why am I not in it? <laughs> I get it. Like Lowly and Co Carnage are really cool, but like I made a lot of I made a lot of videos on Baldur's Gate. Come on, man. <laughs> Initially I had wondered how Warframe was able to hold on to such a consistent player base for so long. Regardless of good or bad updates, new games or financial declines, their core audience has stayed rock solid for over a decade now. And in that, in and of itself, that is a feat that very few games have accomplished. It wasn't until I started streaming my experience over on Twitch, playing the game for the very first time, that I was exposed to the game's community, and in that, I noticed how positive they are. An eerily similar experience I had with Final Fantasy XIV, but altogether completely different. Many players have been hmm. playing the game since Alpha. They've unlocked everything in the game, effectively beaten the game, logging thousands of hours. However, they are still logging in regularly, even daily. That's they crazy. are out there guiding new players and doing things that they've done thousands of times because they love the game that much. And I was curious where that comes from. Well, sure, the game has regular updates, new content, new weapons, and new Warframes. I couldn't see how Warframe could become somebody's daily driver until I saw how Digital Extremes engages with their community. Hmm. Oftentimes, developers lay silent between content releases and major updates. They put their head in the sand, they let a couple people go out and respond or repost on Twitter, and only come out of hibernation to make promotional content to drive up interest around the next big update or major change. In that time of silence, I think it makes it feel like updates are further apart than they actually are. Players aren't engaged, and when they aren't engaged, they lose interest. And 
DE makes it really hard for you not to feel engaged as they support their community like they're content creators rather than game developers. Every single week, they go live on YouTube and Twitch to do something they call a dev short, where Steve Sinclair, the CEO of Digital Extremes, together with Rebecca Ford, the once community manager and now creative director of Warframe, just talk to the players for 15 minutes. They answer questions. Yeah. They tell them about things that they're working on. They joke around. They do this. That's kind of crazy to think that you got like the CEO and like the community manager. I don't know who's who, uh, but... Bro, like, I couldn't imagine, like, a AAA developer doing this. Like, at all. <laughs> this is crazy. It's every week. What other game studios give that kind of transparency to the players? What other game companies are that grounded to make sure that their CEO of all people is constantly in contact with the players? None. And that's not all they do. Every Wednesday and Thursday, they host prime time over on Twitch. And e and you know what? He he brings up a good point. There are no other, seemingly no other developers that do that, because I don't know. It's like it's like you don't really value the opinions of of your audience, the people you're making a game for. So because you don't value those opinions, you're just gonna not show yourself. Uh, publicly. So, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think about. <laughs> Each of them have their own separate streams for English and Spanish, where the developers and community managers come out to play the game with the players. Have you ever heard of anything more absurd than that? Developers actually playing their game and playing their game with players with an audience up to 250,000 viewers giving away skins, Twitch drops, different items, premium currencies. They tell stories. They play trivia games with chat, and they show off different community art submissions. They are more involved with their community than I think any developer ever has been, and the fruits of their labor shine so brightly. Hmm. It shines in how positive their community is, how engaged they are, how well the game is developed and supported, how solid the monetization is, it's why they are allowed to take the risks with the games like they have, and even with future games in development like Soulframe. The players know that they're appreciated. They know that the developer is trying to achieve something, and they can tell that they truly love what they are doing. They can clearly see that these developers love their game, and it shows. Digital Extremes recognizes what many developers have slowly started to drift away from, that players are a part of your game, and without them, your game wouldn't be what it is. And in fact, for Warframe, that's literally true. In the early days of Warframe, movement is exactly what you would have expected the game to be. Just a over-the-shoulder third-person shooter. It had mm -hmm. sliding and running, but overall the movement was slow. Players discovered an exploit where they called it Zorin Coptering, where they could essentially fly across maps, sling themselves across maps, and complete missions in a fraction of the time. Oh shit, that was an exploit? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like how tap strafing is and wall bouncing is for like apex <laughs> except this developer acknowledged uh the the what do you call it the exploit and they just came out with an update that's like yeah you guys don't have to do the hard button presses anymore yeah the, that mechanic is just in the game and then you look at apex and uh, yeah <laughs> Instead of removing this, instead of standing against the players and changing something that the players were enjoying or doing, they recognized that the players were exploiting this because they were trying to avoid something that was actively ruining their experience. So Digital Extremes revamped the entire movement system for the game, reworking it from the ground up to be one of the most fluid movement systems in all of gaming. Oh yeah. This video took a lot. The movement system, super crisp. Any third person game, you can always compare the movement to Warframe, whether or not it's intended or not. I mean, yeah, whatever. But anytime there's a third person shooter, you could have bullet jumping, you could have sliding, you could have wall climbing, you could have wall running, you could. Same thing with uh, any sort of like third person melee. You could have 
you know, you're probably going to have like light attack, heavy attack, and some jumping attack and other stuff, but you could have sliding, you could have sprinting, you could have bullet jumping and all that shit. A lot longer to record than I thought it would. It's already dark outside. You might actually end up hearing my cat chattering with another cat that shows up outside. This little orange cat. They just kind of talk through the window. It's adorable. <laughs> Over the last few years, I've noticed a conversation that's popped up between game developers and game journalists, and they're talking about how cold and unfeeling and how unsympathetic gamers are towards the plight of the industry, how some of these companies are failing, how games are failing, how companies are going out of business, how people are losing their jobs. And Well, again, I would reiterate, it's not the, the job of the consumer to worry about how a product is made. Uh, because there's no other aspect of your life that you you give a shit about that. I mean, yeah, that's just, and a lot of the studios that are closing are, are closing because the games are bad that are coming out. Why would you support studios that make bad games? Don't be a shit eater. And they are absolutely right. Because at the end of the day, we are consumers, we're buying games, and if you do not make a game that we want to play and it wasn't worth our money and we wasted it on your game and you go out of business as a result of that, that's on you. You got what you got coming to you. Mm -hmm. But it didn't used to be like that. And I think the reason why is because back, and this is something that's just kind of evolved over time, is that many of the companies that are out there right now, some of the biggest companies that are out there right now came from Humble Beginnings, no different than Larian Studios yeah. or Digital Extreme. Yeah, little old, little old Blizzard used to be a company that everybody widely regarded as like, this is awesome, this company's awesome, World of Warcraft or just regular Warcraft, uh, Starcraft, uh, but what else? He had like a couple other Blizzard games, uh, Diablo, so on and so forth from Blizzard. Uh, Bethesda, you know, it wasn't such a meme copy paste company it made original Assassin's Creed's, you know, remember the ones with like Ezio Auditore, uh, what else? Uh, Splinter Cell, a lot of the old Tom Clancy games. Uh, no, that's Ubisoft. I said Bethesda. No, Bethesda. Uh, what else? Uh, you had Oblivion. You have Skyrim, you have Fallout. Now what do we have? We got Starfield. What a meme that was. Dreams or anyone else that's out there, but when they were smaller, they felt like they were one of us because they were, they were, they were one of us. They yeah. were players that were making games because they wanted to make cool games for them to play and for other people to play. But as time went on and they got bigger and they made more money and they started selling out and literally selling out to other companies, what ended up happening is, is that that conversation changed. That interaction that we used to have, that relationship that we used to have with the developers, that parasocial-like relationship that we had, started... I don't know. When I was a little kid, I never thought of myself as being, like, kind of parasocial with the developers. I just knew this dev made this game. Now they're making this game. Okay, they kind of got, like, the vouch because that game was good. That was it for me as a little kid. Started to disappear because they started talking to us through a veil of money. It was always apology letters and tweets that are <laughs> just trying to manipulate the truth more than anything else. It's all. Oh, uh, remember that uh, collage of apology letters that some dude <laughs> made on Twitter? <laughs> it was like 15 apology letters <laughs> from devs. <laughs> Gaslighting. You're not trying to help us. You're not trying to do anything for us. You're just trying to make money. And to be honest with you, it's cowardice. It's so disgusting. Like if you just want to make money, go make money, dog. Say you're doing it for it. I'd almost have more respect for a company that just laid their nuts out on the table and said, <laughs> we're doing it because we want your money. Rather than trying to paint it in these colorful words to try to make it feel like they're our friends and really this is all just for you guys. Yeah. That's not what it is. Nope. <laughs> I think there's a lot to learn from a company like Digital Extremes, especially in the way that they stay connected with their audience. 
that level of connection brings in insane levels of endearment where the people that are playing the game just genuinely love the work that the people are doing because they like the people too. They like both things at the exact same time. And that is, I think something like the little dev logs or the dev shorts that the DE does. I think something like that is only possible with like smaller or mid-level companies that are making games. I don't think that's possible for like AAA developers. They're just too big. Too many people know about them. And they're too polarizing with some of their games. Bro, imagine uh, like some of the developers uh, from Ubisoft that have been working on Assassin's Creed Shadows. If they came out with like a little weekly thing, they would literally be berated every time they like they did their, their thing about so much bullshit that's going on with the game. That's an awesome thing to have. My cat is freaking out right now. <laughs> That's an awesome thing to have because players at the end of the day do want to be appreciated. We want to be heard. And the more we're heard and the more we're appreciated and the more that the game is actually worth our time and money, the more likely we are to continue to invest in that game and invest in future things that you do. However, the vast majority of the industry is really doing nothing other than creating unloyal fan bases. Sure, your game might be doing okay now, but the minute that somebody else comes by, like digital extremes or something like that that does the same things that they do or better. <laughs> Your audience is gone. And I think there's a lot to learn from this. I really do. That's the whole reason I make these wake up call videos in the first place is because I think there is a lot to learn from some of the best studios that are on the market. Some of the best games that are on the market. Oh there's yeah. A ton of them. There is. And I plan on doing a ton of these videos because they're, they're a lighthouse, an opportunity for those who have drifted too far away to finally see the light, come back to land, touch grass, and find out what players like, what players really I honestly don't think any AAA developers can really come back from... There, there's just, like, too much money behind them. They're too big to fail. Uh, if a smaller or, or mid-level size company... Uh, wants to stay like core, like look at it from software, from software coming out with bangers every time, old school, like medieval, uh, with all the, the souls likes, uh, even like you got your mech thing with, uh, the armored core six freaking stellar, uh, from software bangers left and right. Uh, but you look at something like some company like Ubisoft kind of like a coin flip whether or not the game is good or bad and even if it is good it's like at least i would say about 20 to 40 percent of the player base that doesn't think the game is good they're just like they're just like hell bent on all games are bad we <laughs> want and how to talk to players again anyway I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you guys for watching it this long. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. If you like the video and want more people to see it, Quack. throw a like on the video. Follow me on Twitch if you guys want to see me play Warframe or other games and talk about video game news and all that good stuff. Outside of that, I'm going to take off. Stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe, my friends, and I will see you next time. Bye. Again, I'd like to thank World of Tanks for sponsoring. Oh, man. Yeah, man. Warframe is a wake-up call. Like, ever since getting back into it and me, like, actually trying to, like, engage with all the systems, um, I have learned the folly of my ways in just simply dabbling into it versus, like, making it, like, a, like, a main game. And it's fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> you know, like, I'm an FPS bro. I dabble in other shit, but... Dang. So like so far, Warframe has my attention and it's keeping it. But uh yeah. Overall, good ass video. I I like it. I wish more companies would like uh do monetization like Warframe, but I understand if uh they can't. And if they can't, then I'm simply not really gonna pay attention to their game, to be honest. Uh but that's just me. Uh we'll see what happens in the future of video games. But other than that, 
good stuff and i want to see more like wake up call videos that's pretty cool i like it but uh that's it for me i'll catch you guys on the next one all right later